independence, love, social convention, gender roles, and religion. Charlotte Bronte's most famous novel challenges ideas on all these topics, and we are here to discuss it. I'm Charlene. And I'm Mike. And this is Jane Eyre Files. Chapter 27, Part 2. I Care for Myself. Hello, husband. Hello, my good angel. Oh, again, great choices. We are back. This, mm-hmm. this, I wouldn't call it a bonus episode. It's just a jam-packed chapter. And we really needed two episodes to discuss the whole thing. So what was, uh, should we have like a recap or previously <laughs> on Jane Eyre Files? What would you discuss in the previous episode? Well, we went over the lengthy SparkNote summary of Chapter 27. So lengthy. Well, we're not going to repeat it here, so you're no. just going to have to go back to the previous episode and listen to that. And we talked a little bit about Jane's description of leaving Rochester and and Rochester sitting across the threshold of her door waiting for her to come out. And then the bulk of the episode was about Rochester's justification of his actions. We also mentioned how violent the Bible is. <laughs> And how lunatic asylums were not a great place to be in that time. That's correct. So that kind of brings us into my second discussion point for this episode. Let's talk about the lunatic. (laughs) Yes, the nature of Bertha Mason. So, you know, Rochester justifies his actions by basically saying Bertha is not a great person. So let's, let's, let's look at how he describes her. But I feel like it's important to think that we're going to take what Rochester is telling Jane as the truth, that it's that he is telling her, you know, exactly what kind of person Bertha is and why Rochester finds it so difficult to be married to her. Yeah. Bertha's right. quite a bit. I mean, she's a complex character. Mm-hmm. And I think, as we mentioned, you know, we did a March Madness style bracket mm-hmm. recently. Air Madness, we called it, about where you, where you came up with 16 characters from the book and had them compete in a head-to-head bracket. And for whatever reason, the best character in the book finished in a second-place runner-up mm. to Bertha Mason, which I was kind of shocked by. And so we kind of get we need to get an idea of who she is because why, all these many years later, is she considered such, yeah, like I said, a complex character where people are trying to find justifications for why she was mistreated, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And so... Locked up. Yeah, and so, and I, I, we talked about it on the last episode. I still have issues with how Rochester tried to justify what he has done. Mm-hmm. So, but then it's like, well, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk right now. Let's mm-hmm. let's find out what was the issue with Bertha, and maybe could I come around on my decision of how I felt about Rochester once we kind of get to know Bertha. All right. Okay. Well, let's let's begin the fact that Rochester has had this whirlwind courtship and marriage. And he didn't really get a chance to get to know Bertha. And during their honeymoon, he realizes he has made a big mistake in marrying her. Yeah, that's got to be very common in in arranged marriages. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of couples that have been in that situation and faced the same problem. Unfortunate for him, there's apparently some sort of mental illness that was Mm -hmm. accompanying that. But most people, I would imagine, even in arranged marriages, find find a way to make it work, even if it's just to make their families happy. That's true. I mean, there's you know the way that maybe arranged marriages go, or the, people don't get along. You know, they they're not compatible or as compatible as they'd like to be. And this is something that Rochester brings up that Bertha's quote nature whole, is wholly alien to his. Her tastes obnoxious to him. Her cast of mind common, low, narrow, and singularly incapable of being led to anything higher, expanded to anything larger. That seems like normal. That seems like normal disagreements (laughs) between couples. All right. Well, then how about this quote from Rochester again? When I perceived that I should never have a quiet or settled household because no servant would bear the continued outbreaks of her violent and unreasonable temper or the vexations of her absurd, contradictory, exacting orders. Yeah. Now, that's an interesting perspective that I hadn't thought of. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to find good help. Yeah. Right. And, and. When you're when you're reading this chapter, and he's trying to justify by saying, "Oh, she was mad, and I didn't know this, and I love you, Jane." And you're like, "Okay, he's like you said, he's he's what I said in the last episode. He's painted himself into a corner." But then mm-hmm. now you're like, 
oh, okay, yeah, that, God, how hard would that be at that it's, time? It's also not just like, oh, Rochester thinks that Bertha is difficult. Apparently, the servants, they don't want to even stay. They they don't want to bear this these her violent and, and unreasonable temper. Yeah. So how difficult is that for Rochester to bear? And what's so funny is, when we, I was talking about the, when we did our Air Madness bracket, you made fun of me because I kept picking Grace Poole against some of the other characters. And you're like, Grace Poole. And I'm like, Grace Poole had to put up with Bertha. <laughs> that Rochester couldn't do it. I'm like, she needs to get some some points for that. Well, but yeah, true. it's, I mean, it, it, that's where I'm, I'm not, if there is the pendulum swinging and whether or not I'm, I agree with Rochester justifications, it's swinging back a little bit more because yeah, you're just like, that would be incredibly difficult mm-hmm. because, you know, he does have a, this great big house. As long as I guess all, all you gotta do is find one Grace that can kind of keep an eye on her, but still it would have it would have made for a really really difficult time for sure. Right, and you know let's let's go back again to Rochester saying that her nature is wholly alien to mine, and that I guess he couldn't have like intelligent conversations with her. He felt like he couldn't talk to her. I don't know if that 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 seems like that's kind of a big issue. Like maybe you know some someone in another arrange a marriage that he might you know gradually grow to have like common interests and things that they, they they enjoy talking about but the fact that he feels like maybe that he can't have intelligent conversations with Bertha that she's very dismissive of him maybe mm. and I just feel like that's uh it's, it's it's going to be a little too difficult I mean some people you, you can you know argue that arranged marriages can work out but sometimes they can't right well and maybe he's spoiled Maybe, you know, because maybe, I'm maybe sure there's a lot spoiled. of, well, I'm, I'm sure there's back in that era, maybe married couples didn't talk. <laughs> they just had the babies so yeah. that they could. She had her own room. He had his own room. Yeah. Right? You know, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, yes. Finding shared interests, you know, like there's some elements of this book that for being written 175 years ago do have modern qualities to mm-hmm. it. And there's some that obviously don't like the idea of divorce, but the fact that you have a, you have a protagonist main well i should say protagonist jane's a protagonist right but you have a byronic hero character Mm -hmm. who wants something more out of a marriage yeah which is what some which is like what the kind of situation that people now right i I feel like they have you have a hard time marrying somebody without having a lot of great interest or having some kind of i think that back then you know romances they weren't they weren't. It wasn't as important to, for them to have this sort of mental connection. Mm-hmm. You know, they if they kind of physically liked each other, or you know, they had good manners or something. It's that not a financial that would arrangement. Be enough. Yes. Yeah. So that would be romantic enough, even for for a romance story. That that's why they would fall in love. Whereas Rochester and Jane, you know, they take time. Charlotte Bronte takes time to build their sort of mental connection mm-hmm. and how they love to talk to each other. And how that's important yeah, that that we that's why we really want them to be together. Yeah, and that's why that's why this book is timeless. You chose mm-hmm. a really good book to have as your favorite <laughs> to force you to read. Well, I mean, you you didn't force it. It was I was really flattered that you bought me a copy oh. at the Bronte Parsonage and asked me to read it. Yeah, and then I bought you a copy in the airport in Raleigh, North Carolina, mm-hmm. as a gift to add to my collection. Yeah, and we've <laughs> since I've since bought you a few copies over the years as mm-hmm. well. Yeah, but yeah, now again, now that I'm rereading this, I'm picking up on stuff like that, which mm-hmm. I never would have thought the first time around, where it's like. How come characters, it's nice to see characters aspire to something more than what, whatever, where their station was in life, mm-hmm. you know, again, can it justify the, the, what he's done? I, the pendulum's swinging back in his favor as well, is all I'll say at this point. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to go into another aspect that Rochester describes about Bertha, um, detailing some of her behavior, which is a little unclear of what exactly she did or how she was like for the four years that they were married in the West Indies. But I think that it's important to look at the wording of some of the things that he says. Mm -hmm. So there's one quote where he says, I was doubtless covered with grimy dishonor, but I resolved to be clean in my own sight. And to the last, I repudiated the contamination of her crimes and wrenched myself from connection with her mental defects. And then again, he says, how fearful were the curses those propensities entailed on me. Bertha Mason, the true daughter of an infamous mother, dragged me through all the hideous and degrading agonies which must attend a man bound to a wife at once intemperate and unchaste. Now, sometimes I felt when I was reading this section that 
perhaps he's exaggerating these details a little bit just mm. for additional sympathy. He's very histrionic in this chapter. Oh, I you see. You know, making things out to be so much more bigger than they were. Oh, it was horrible to be with her. and the, I, I'm Maybe. sure it was. Maybe. And I'm sure it's, it was, but yeah. he is sort of playing it up for, for to sympathy. effect. Yeah, yeah. Try to convince Jane that uh, he won't... It's okay to marry him or to be with him. Yeah. And then when he says that she was unchaste, are we talking about like adulteress? She was a philander of, of some court? That's what I believe the uh, the word means. I think there's there's just the one adaptation of Jane Eyre, the 2006 miniseries that when Rochester is kind of recounting his story, it shows Bertha with another man and Rochester comes up upon them. So... You know, it's not, it's not, it's a, it's a valid interpretation of that word, unchaste, mm -hmm. meaning then that she had affairs and that, I feel like that's like a definite insult to men in general at the time when the purity of a woman was seen as important. So I can see that's another clear reason why Rochester would feel their marriage is a failure. Mm, yeah. But it's okay for him to go, him to eventually go gallivanting hey, that's the double stuff. standard of the time. Oh, uh, true, true. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm wondering, like, you know, her being unchaste, as we say, you know, do you think that might, was that a symptom of her madness? You know, it, it seems to be a little unclear as to when her madness began. You know, if she was, if she's having affairs, are these other men totally cool with how she behaves and <laughs> while they're doing this? Or was well, she just, they were just attracted, smitten they were, with her? She was pretty and yeah. she probably didn't, maybe they didn't have a long conversation with her. Yeah. But I also think that, you know, that she, there was some time before her actual madness showed itself that that, that mm -hmm. what what rochester is describing in the beginning is her actual kind of personality that she was difficult to talk to that she had a bad temper and that she was unreasonable and she had these outbreaks you know there's a quote i want to point out that rochester says he says my brother in the interval was dead and at the end of the four years my father died too i was rich enough now yet poor to hideous indigence a nature the most gross impure depraved i ever saw was associated with mine and called by the law and by society a part of me, and I could not rid myself of it by any legal proceedings. For the doctors now discovered that my wife was mad. Her excesses had prematurely developed the germs of insanity. So he's saying that everything that she's been doing in the past few years now developed, accelerated the development of her insanity. Mm -hmm. And then, like, yeah, so I guess if she was having these dalliances with these gentlemen they probably didn't care about making a mental connection with no her. no but then i you know i feel like there was one sort of interpretation i've read that the, the explanation for bertha's madness also some of the physical characteristics that jane describes of her having bloated features or purple features mm -hmm. that that's a, a sign of syphilis oh so now that she might have an std oh <laughs> if she was philandering yeah then perhaps yeah okay yeah, I mean, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, for Obviously, sure. Obviously, I'm not sure if, how much Charlotte Bronte knew about syphilis and the, the description of it, of the symptoms. So I yeah. don't know how accurately we could say that that is the case for Bertha. And what were the treatments back then? Just get the leeches. <laughs> it's always the leeches. It's always the leeches. It never <laughs> fails. And as we discussed in the last chapter, I, I want to believe that perhaps the Masons and the Rochesters together were not conniving mm -hmm. to keep things from him. But is that was that the case? Does it seem like, you know, I wanted to give them credit, but I don't think you do. No, no. I, you know, the the way that Rochester says that his father and his brother really wanted them him to get married just so that they can make sure that he's taken care of. Because also, I guess the father wants to make sure all the money goes to just the one um, brother and that doesn't break up the state by giving half to the brother and half to Rochester. So uh, I think it's also interesting to note that, you know, in case detractors of Rochester might point out that, you know, Rochester again is, is, is all his point of view that he's seeing what Bertha has done and he's interpreting her as this awful being that there's another moment in Rochester mentions to Jane that, you know, they, they had wanted that he is keeping his marriage a secret and that his father and brother also wanted to keep his marriage a secret to their acquaintances because, as he says, um, quote, very soon the infamous conduct of the wife my father had selected for me was such as to make him blush to own her as his daughter-in-law. Mm -hmm. Another another outside view, I guess, of 
Bertha's actions and and the father isn't quite happy with Bertha's actions and nature. Yeah, but once again, if I may play devil's advocate, perhaps that's the same reason that the Mason family didn't talk about Bertha's mother. You know, this idea of it was it would make them blush. They don't it's But then again, it's you know, it's you probably need to tell someone about tell the prospective groom that seems that okay. the error the the error wouldn't be that they maybe didn't want to talk about it because understandably they probably didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. But they, the fact that they deliberately kept it a secret because they wanted Rochester to marry Bertha and not mm. not back out for any reason. I guess. But again, <laughs> there's some stigmas attached to it. We don't talk about Bertha's mother. <laughs> no, no. Oh, remix. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's funny too. That, you know, the way that Bertha's described by Rochester, her actions um, being so uh, infamous and outrageous that it's uh, kind of reminds me of some of the maybe more outrageous actions that people on reality shows of today do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe. I just feel like that a lot of that stuff is, is staged or people, oh. they know that they, they know what they're doing. A lot Cameras of times. are on them. Well, uh, yeah. And, then, it. and a lot of times, you know, if they, they would want to stand out above among the other castmates on these shows, because mm-hmm. that promotes their brand, mm-hmm. so that when the show is off the air, then you're that guy. Oh, you're, I see. you're the guy from the Jersey Shore. Right. You're, the, you're that one person from Survivor that got to be in a movie mm-hmm. because you're the one that kind of stood out. But, oh, true. Yeah. Well, the last thing that I, I did want to talk about before we move on from this discussion is, uh, Charlene, you have the floor. I would like you to tell our listeners about the 1966 novel written by Jean Rhys called Wide Sargasso Sea. And I know this is a, this is a, when you told me what this was, I said, Ooh, that sounds interesting. And you said, I hate this book. <laughs> and for just, can we just tell the listeners what this book is? Give us the interpretation real brief about why you hate this and how it fits into this whole discussion that we're having right now. Okay. Well, thanks for setting that up. Um, So, yeah, you know, I think I mentioned in when we were talking about chapter 26, that the idea of Bertha being sort of more prosecuted, uh, sort of a victim of Rochester and the you know, like the the, uh, the more feminist outlook on no. Bertha started with the 1979 academic treatise, uh, The Mad Woman in the Attic. Mm-hmm. But this predates that. This yes. is 1966. It probably, um, it might, it might actually be more relevant to the idea of a more feminist interpretation of Bertha. And I will say that I read this book in high school, um, probably my senior year, I think. And I was, after you know, Jane Eyre or before well, Jane? Yes, Eyre. Oh, okay. Jane Eyre. I wasn't. I read it because of Jane Eyre. Okay, okay, making sure. And you know, it was, it was uh, my formative years, and I was a huge fan of Jane Eyre. I've not um, tried rereading White Sargasso Sea again, but the idea that this book again has this feminist interpretation, also this like post-colonial interpretation of Bertha, you know, being. Um, a woman who is kind of forced into this marriage to this man who doesn't really love her and you know the what what that kind of does to her and the fact that she's in this kind of weird social status of being like a creole which at the time is like i think i think rochester says that her mother was a creole Mm -hmm. and a creole being um a, a, a person of european and african american descent so that you know, being mixed race, you know, Bertha might have had it a little bit more difficult in a, in a European, in Europeans eyes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that, I mean, these are all valid points, but I just did, I just don't think that Charlotte Bronte would have really intended this view that, you know, Rochester is not someone who's taking advantage of Bertha. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously he, he made a mistake in marrying her. He's making a mistake in trying to marry Jane. But he it started out with good intentions. And then now he's just uh, kind of rationalizing and justifying his actions because he wants to be happy. Yeah. I feel like, you know, ever since you told me about this book, I, I was like, oh, it sounds interesting. And then you're like, no, no, no. Don't, you know, I know there's been some adaptations made. There's, there, been, some, there's been a couple of adaptations, yes. You know, and, and it's just, it, you know, it does, it just kind of shows 
maybe Rochester being more manipulative and taking and mm. and wanting to yeah basically take advantage of Bertha and and just using her. So I just mm. you know it's just not quite the interpretation of Rochester that gels <laughs> to me, with to? me. Yeah. yeah. Well, what's funny was when I was doing a little bit of preliminary re- just just very limited research on the the book i did see like on the wikipedia page for example it lists that it was on a couple of list of the hundred uh best novels in yeah, the last yeah. hundred years or it was on you know and so now that having discussed rochester's actions in our previous episode and not trying to be contrarian but now i find myself kind of wanting to maybe give white sargasso see a chance just to see that perspective we're not going to read Mad Woman in the Attic because, I mean, it's like I, I have a tough time with literary criticism. Mm-hmm. But if this is an actual novel that has been adapted into features, or maybe I could just watch one <laughs> watch of the, the movie. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a lot easier, you know. Yeah. But I, I, there is something about getting into the the mind of this this character that we know so little about. Mm-hmm. You laughed at me, but um, I will tell the listeners that we we had a conversation one time where I said we should write a book about what happened to John Reed. <laughs> and you're like, no, I don't, I don't want that. And I'm like, it could be like White Sargasso C. Like, what was it? What did this character do when he stepped outside of this book? And I'm always fascinated by the idea of, you know, as long as it's it's not uh, true to the original author's intention or it's, it's not defamatory or whatever, mm-hmm. the idea that you can take a, a, a literary character who's not really well developed and then try to make a book about that character. Mm. So like a spin-off, if you will. It wasn't there's the like the famous play, um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, right? Yeah, no. So that that's, sort I mean, of that's, idea. That's always an interesting idea. I mean that's yeah. why I read a lot of Jane Eyre derived literature. Yeah, there's know, been re- a lot of modern them, reinterpretations. That? Yeah, there's there's a ton. There's from Mrs. Fairfax's point of view, there's Adele's really? point of view. So yeah, there's a lot a lot to read if you're interested. But nothing is rises to the level of White Sargasso Sea. I think probably the critical interpretation and the fact that it's very well written, you know, that elevates it more than the sort of fun reads that you might get with, uh, you know, a book from Mrs. Fairfax's point of view. Okay. At this point, I think we can probably just put Bertha back in the attic. (laughs) Lock that door. For our last discussion point, what are we going to look at now, Charlene? Well, I wanted to look at, is Jane right in leaving Rochester? Yes, (laughs) <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. We're gonna we're gonna have a, a discussion here. Well, I, I I wanted to more dive, not necessarily that I don't think she's right in leaving Rochester, but dive into why she's so conflicted about leaving Rochester. Okay. And you know this, as I mentioned in previous episodes, this story is a constant balance between passion and reason, and I feel like this chapter just showcases that, where Rochester embodies passion while Jane must hold on and she's the reasonable person because we need the balance and Jane holds on to her principles and what she has always believed to be right in the face of her turbulent emotions yeah that's an excellent point you know and I was going to ask you is this very indicative of Victorian literature like do the Jane Austen heroines face these kind of dilemmas oh well that's I don't know if it's quite as uh serious of a dilemma as Jane has in front of her where, you know, maybe like, you know, pride and prejudice, they have a miscommunication and they, they judge each other wrongly. And then they finally realize that they are, they admire each other and they love each other. It's not quite the same conflict. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I know we've always talked about it, but this idea that that the one who's the younger one, Jane, he's half her, he's half Rochester's age, but yet she seems to have a more level head. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it, when we talk about she has to be the one to balance all these emotions, but how come Rochester doesn't? Like, how does he just not have the ability to balance those emotions where it's just his passion is, is so overwhelming that, that he doesn't can't think about reason and, and yeah. logic? Yeah, I think that, you know, we're okay, this is sort of the sort of literary interpretation where you need you need to drive the story forward by having Jane fight basically fight Rochester's love for her and that the conflict comes because Jane is the one who has to make the decision. Rochester, the, Rochester's made his decision. He wants to marry Jane. He mm-hmm. wants to be with Jane. So it's up to Jane to kind of work through her emotions. And, you know, Rochester's decision is more passion based and not really reason based. Mm-hmm. And that's not going to really work for Jane. No, no. I think that's why that this book is just so steamy. 
Oh, the, the, the romantic tension. I mean, yeah, it's it it just it keeps building and building, and toward the end, it just it goes off the charts when, when <laughs> when she they finally start to kind of like look arguing. Right. She's right. just listening for the longest time, and then she has to kind of to lay down the law with him and say, yeah. "No, this isn't this can't work. You have to you have to quit think with your head and not with your heart." Sometimes I know you're, mm. maybe you're supposed to think with your heart, but he's kind of blinded. Right. Definitely. Yeah. You don't love me then. It was only my station and the rank of wife that you valued. Now you find me disqualified to be your husband, you recoil from me. I do love you more than ever. But I must not show or indulge the feeling, and this is the last time I must express it. I must leave you, Mr. Rochester. Oh, Jane, you must be reasonable, or in truth I shall go mad. If I were to live with you as you desire, I should then be your mistress, a thing owned by you. And that I will not be, both for my own sake and for yours. Jane, I'm not a gentle-tempered man. Do you truly mean to go one way in the world and leave me to go another? I do. So going back into the idea of Jane's conflict over whether she should stay with Rochester or not, something comes up and Rochester is telling her his history that Jane takes it as something to help her decide not to stay with him, where Rochester tells Jane about all the mistresses he took on and how they were of an inferior status to him and that being with people who are inferior to you is degrading. Oh, it, was, it was such a, it's hard to read that part because he comes off really, really arrogant. Oh, sure. And idea. it's just very dismissive of all these women. Yeah. Like, oh, they, they were pretty, but they weren't, uh, they weren't smart enough for me. Yeah. What does that say about you? <laughs> that you, that you still, he went felt, for the pretty woman. He still went for it, even though, even if they weren't stimulating him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Jane does take this to heart and she uses that to remind herself that if she becomes his mistress, he might find it degrading to be with her in time. Yeah, I totally believe that. You know, she could be the next in line, especially especially given her background and status, you know, that who's to say that she won't just be another feather in his cap, you know? Mm-hmm. I guess, you know, I guess we want to believe that he's being sincere in his feelings for her, but yeah, there's always a chance that that yep. you know especially because like i said she's just the governess right and i'm sure i you know we joke about like you're not supposed to fall in love with the governess i would not be surprised if there were gentlemen who had who had these big estates that may have had affairs with the affairs of the governess and mm-hmm. maybe told them oh yeah yeah i'll leave the wife and then they don't or something right. so this right. that part's kind of easy to believe and also i i just don't I'm not sure how Jane is supposed to react when she's learning of his <laughs> I know. prior it's conquests. It's difficult to be like, okay, well, you're with a bunch of other women. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll, you know, we tr- I think something as men that we, we need to be better at mm-hmm. is to not, because you don't need to hear that unless it's something where we're, we're hoping we can build off of a prior mistake. But mm. these ones, well, I, guess I don't he know, is trying to build trying off a to, but it also to me comes off a little bit like, like I said, it's very arrogant. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I don't, you know, I, I will say that, you know, Jane thinks, Jane wonders that if, if she's in that position where he's basically turning her into his mistress, that he might not have as much respect for her. And that's a valid point that Jane might think that. But I think, honestly, Rochester would be faithful to her and he would love her and be a good husband to her. Well, fake husband to her. <laughs> Well, to wrap up our discussion points here for this episode, we talked about the nature of Bertha Mason. Was she deserving of the top or the second spot in the air madness bracket that we set up? Yeah. Well, again, it makes me want to revisit this character. Uh And if I have to read Wide Sargasso Sea to do it, I I, I wonder because I always thought of it as, what was she, a clothed hyena? (laughs) That was, and, yeah, that was and, a description. And she's, and she's the gothic monster, mm-hmm. right? And yet enough people seem to think that she is totally misunderstood and mistreated. Right. That, and, and especially now that the way that we look at mental illness. Mm, now, that's you know, But this is, this is more savage, right? Yeah. Tacking her brother and drawing blood. You know, that's where that's another point of like she's uh she has homicidal tendencies, which, you know, is not something that we would normally gloss over in any yeah. situation. Like we're not going to allow people to kill other people. But then does that mean that she could ever be? I wonder if that that's a, that's a good point. Could she have ever been taken in by the authorities? Oh, <laughs> and then he could yeah. get, get, he could get his divorce. You know, maybe, oh, I don't know. Oh, that's good. I don't know how that works exactly. Like, sure, she could be taken to by the authorities. Obviously, Rochester's secret would be revealed, 
And then she probably would have just put into an insane asylum and mistreated, which is what Rochester oh, was trying true. to avoid this whole time. <laughs> yeah. Was domestic violence a thing back then? Could she, oh, you know? Get a divorce based on that? I, I, yeah. Oh, I yeah. Know. I wonder. But I, I do. I, I will give some of the, the, the feminist critics the benefit of the doubt and say that, yeah, perhaps she was a misunderstood mm-hmm. character that we don't really know much about. And again, mm-hmm. I, guess I, I hate to keep reiterating it, but I, I, I find myself kind of drawn to White Sargasso Sea, even if I just watch an adaptation as long as it's a good adaptation that people think is faithful okay. to that well there we go there's a there's a another episode of the podcast we can do we can talk about wide sargasso sea we're running out of chapters we've only got about 11 <laughs> 10 or 11 more right yeah. and then Cause i far- mean i i feel like i come down on the idea that you know bertha again what was the intention of the author and yeah. to me the intention was not that bertha was this sort of victim and blameless that she you know, she had some some real unfortunate mental issues, and but she was also not quite a nice person mm-hmm. um, before she was declared insane. So Rochester was truly unhappy, and he didn't deserve that kind of marriage. Mm-hmm. That's fair. That's fair. And then as far as, you know, Jane leaving Rochester and, and her mm-hmm. justifications, you know, I think when I first read this book i was hoping that jane would have stayed that's but then, surprising to me. yeah i didn't know that because i think it was just because it's just it's such a great love it's a great mm-hmm. love that these two characters have for each other but then i i also feel like the more that i read the more that i continued through the book that first time and now that i'm rereading it I, she'd made the right decision yeah you, it, ha- it has to be you know you hate to see her walk away from the true love but i guess there was a certain code of ethics at that time and i'm not sure that charlotte bronte wanted to be that controversial it's still in what way? just the, the idea that she would have stayed and been a and been the oh, mistress. And been a like mistress. again, oh, this right. is the autobiography. The autobiography of this character. Yeah. You don't want it to be like, oh yeah, I accepted this as the as the second as the other wife. Right. You know, there's a reason this book st- has stood the test of time like that. And I'm mm-hmm. wondering if if Charlotte had gone down a very controversial path. Mm-hmm. Which I'm probably, I mean, it was probably it was very notable for its time, right? I mean, it got yep. it probably was a lot of there was a lot of buzz surrounding it but yeah. the fact that she didn't go too far off in that end where it would people who would have might have dismissed it a lot easier because i'm sure that just people been would offended have been, yeah i'm sure that the people had their religious sensibilities about them in 1847 so, yeah, yeah yeah i mean i i also think that jane made the right decision that this was for you know this is something that she did for herself like she was strong enough to not give into the temptation of you know uh, uh, uh being in love with rochester and living this easy life, you know, she wanted to hold on to what she's always thought as being right. You know, she has her, she has her belief in God, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe Helen Burns helped her out a little bit with that. I wasn't going to say anything, but yeah, I'll say something. Helen Burns, (laughs) Helen, her best character in the book, better than Bertha. (laughs) Well, yes. Okay. I'm glad we've settled that point. We, we have, we are agreeing on that. Mm -hmm. So final thoughts for chapter 27. Jam packed chapter. Yeah, and my favorite part of this chapter is hearing Rochester's version of meeting and falling in love with Jane. It's just so lovely to get this clarity on his actions from the very beginning. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. You know, it's incredibly charming the way that he describes observing her from afar while she was still getting situated at Thornfield. There's a quote that I love where he says, I was vexed with you for getting out of my sight. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, Rochester is swooning with love from almost the very beginning. Yeah. And he, he watches and he's watching her closely and constantly testing her reactions to him. Again, something he says in, in this chapter where his fixed desire was to seek and find a good and intelligent woman whom I could love. So mm. here he, here she is. Yeah. And I think maybe perhaps he's following, you know, a moral code and not immediately falling for the governess or at least letting her know that, you know, got to play hard to get, I guess. Mm-hmm. But it, it is also very uplifting that someone as plain as Jane could attract the eye of such an eligible bachelor. <laughs> True. Well, yeah. you know, beauty is only skin deep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what do, we, what do we have for interesting context from this chapter? Because I thought this was quite interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, I think this is a great little anecdote the, that kind of gives us a little bit of insight into the impact of this story. Where in your copy of Jane Eyre, you might have noticed that Charlotte Bronte dedicated the novel to William Makepeace Thackeray in the second edition because she was a huge fan of his. Um, He was the author of Vanity Fair, which was published in installments in the same year as Jane Eyre. 
Vanity Fair tells the story of a governess, although Becky Sharp is a little different from Jane in that she's more of an anti-heroine and with a lack of morals. I feel like this is one of those novels I've heard of. I mean, obviously, I grew up with the magazine, which got oh, its name from that. Yeah, yeah. But, and I did, I was looking, I mean, I, I can picture the movie poster with Reese, with Reese Witherspoon. Oh, yeah. But I did look and see, I forgot, in the early 1930s, my favorite actress of all time, Myrna Loy, play Becky Sharp in oh. an adaptation of Vanity Fair, which I, I I read that she plays him as, as a very loose, moraled woman. Oh, right. That is, that, is that hard to find, that adaptation? I'm sh- I, I'm trying to think if I've seen it or not, but I'm, I'm sure we could try, I could track that down. Whenever oh. we'll, we'll go through Myrna Loy's entire filmography one day. Oh, and, yeah. Or one year, I should say. Uh, let's let's compare we'll... Vanity Fair to Jane Eyre. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, like I said, that's why I was kind of curious if there were any other... If there are any other differences or similarities, but the fact that Charlotte Bronte seems so enamored with Thackeray's work is kind of, I wonder if it sort of, if it had any kind of influence or, at all on her. Yeah. Well, the funny part of the story is that Charlotte Bronte did dedicate the novel to Thackeray. Um, but since this novel was still published under pseudonym, there was a lot of speculation about the identity of the author. And some people thought that maybe the author was a governess in Thackeray's household because... In another huge coincidence, Thackeray's wife suffered many years of mental illness. Um, It was thought that she was schizophrenic and she tried to kill herself on multiple occasions. So Thackeray had to send her to different private asylums in France and eventually a care home near him. That's that's crazy. No pun intended. Uh, But then, you know, is there any chance that Charlotte may have based Bertha on Thackeray's wife? No, I don't think it was generally known about the the state of of his wife. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure Charlotte did not know about Thackeray's wife because while we don't know her reaction to finding out about her, uh, I imagine she must have been pretty mortified about the coincidence, especially with the rumors that, you know, the author of the novel was Thackeray's governess. Yeah, there's a governess right there. Yeah. <laughs> now, in our previous episode of this podcast we mentioned that there was another casting call audio to share with our listening audience here so mike can you tell us how you came across this audio well i mean i have my back channels oh do I have, you i have some connections the dark but, web huh? yeah yeah but i will say that apparently some point in i think i don't know if it was the late 70s or early 80s there was going to be a musical version of jane Eyre. Like a film musical yes. version? Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I don't know if it was going to be done in the style of a rock opera, which is really popular at that time <laughs> okay. or not. But would you believe, I mean, I think it's inspired casting because he's handsome, really? he's dashing, mm-hmm. and the man can sing. But one of the people under consideration for the role of Edward Fairfax Rochester was the great Neil Diamond. No. Yes. Neil Diamond? Neil Diamond. Oh, bringing his dulcet tones to ah, Mr. Rochester? He is, he, is a, he's a, he is an American legend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I know that this book is not American, but... <laughs> what, best, what better way to bring the British novel to life by casting an American legend? <laughs> but yeah, that's movie producers for you, right? Right. And so we, are, we do have the... It just, it's just audio only. Mm. I, don't, I don't, we don't have video for it. It's just, it's just audio. But I was, I was genuinely surprised that I could find this. Me and too. When I learned of its presence, and we can, one can only wonder what, how this would have, how this would have come out had this been produced. Mm-hmm. Let's give it a listen. Hey, everybody! Thanks for having me. Apparently, you must have seen my work in the Jazz Singer. I was in blackface. Played Olivier's son. Oh, hey, okay. So we're reading for this. Rochester part, Byronic hero. Okay, where's that script? Here we go. Oh, Jane, this is bitter. This, this is wicked. It would not be wicked to love me. We good? That that that's all. That's all. Okay. So then the swell of music probably comes in after that, and he launches into a song about his love for Jane. They're coming to <laughs> Thornfield. Right, that's next. G- genius. Genius. Oh, one can only hope. Oh, I, well. I, I mean, again, I, I mean, the timing of it, it we could have been, I mean, he's... he was on top of the world as a jazz singer. Mm-hmm. And when I say on top of the world, I think he was probably, there was, might have, might have not been on top of the world but uh you know he had his level of popularity 
you know, turn on their heart light with E.T. in the 80s. Oh, right, right. I was fortunate enough to see him in concert several years ago, and he's fantastic. I'm, I'm it's sad that he's not performing anymore, but, uh, oh, yeah, this, just an absolute legend. We can only imagine how that would have come out. I would have loved to have seen that. <laughs> well, thank you for purchasing that, Mike. Hope that wasn't too expensive. No, they again, they actually paid me <laughs> to take it off their hands for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, let's wrap this up. We've got we've, it's such a jam packed chapter, as I said, that we we saved our in, meaningful passage for part two. Charlene, how can you even possibly find one passage from this chapter that sums up that that, that really kind of pulls at you the the, the most? I, I'm very curious to see where you're going to go with this. What is the most meaningful passage or quote from this chapter for you? Well, Mike. It's very difficult to pick one passage out of this chapter because there are a ton of quotes that I really love. A lot of really emotional and meaningful uh, quotes. But this one I've picked, um, I've always really liked it. And I think it supports my viewpoint that Rochester is a character that I sympathize with more than anything else. So this is the part where Rochester asks Jane, do you think that if you were mad that I would not love you. And Jane thinks, yes. So Rochester's response is, then you are mistaken and you know nothing about me and nothing about the sort of love of which I am capable. Every atom of your flesh is as dear to me as my own. In pain and sickness, it would still be dear. Your mind is my treasure. And if it were broken, it would be my treasure still. If you raved, my arms should confine you and not a straight waistcoat. Your grasp, even in fury, would have a charm for me. If you flew at me as wildly as that woman did this morning, I should receive you in an embrace, at least as fond as it would be restrictive. I should not shrink from you with her disgust as I did from her. In your quiet moments, you should have no watcher and no nurse but me, and I could hang over you with untiring tenderness, though you gave me no smile in return and never weary of gazing into your eyes, though they had no longer a ray of recognition for me." So that's something that we that can't kind of came up in our in our discussion of like how difficult it must be to take care of someone you married to who maybe is suffering from mental illness and is and mm-hmm. maybe they're not quite the same person that you married where Rochester is saying in this passage that it's not the same as he would not treat Jane like he's treating Bertha because he didn't love Bertha but he loves Jane and he mm-hmm. would he would take care of her and he would love to take care of her yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. I That was actually one of my... It was in the running. Right, okay. My, I do have it in my notes right here. Page 266, every atom of your flesh is as dear to me as my own. Right. You know, that yeah. is that is kind of very charming. It's just yeah. a very, yeah, very romantic moment. You know, you, even if you you kind of think, oh, Rochester, how terrible of you to lie to Jane and, and try to, like, trap her into this marriage. Well, he does really love her and that's something that jane says too of like you know her conflict over whether she should stay with him of like no one is ever going to love me like rochester loves me mm-hmm. and that's uh you know very powerful oh absolutely yeah that, that that's a very good quote to pull yeah well let's let's hear the quote that you did pick then okay well mine uh comes from later in the chapter i mentioned that the dramatic tension builds up when rochester starts talking about how they first met and then they start, they got to kind of go into an argument. And Jane kicks off the argument by basically saying, like, don't bring this up. And, oh, and right. so in specific, um, the, the exact quote begins like this. Quote, don't talk any more of those days, sir, I interrupted, furtively dashing away some tears from my eyes. His language was torture to me, for I knew what I must do and do soon. And all these reminiscences. And these revelations of his feelings only made my work more difficult. Because mm. like you, you, there's you, as you're reading this chapter, you're thinking like, okay, is she going to go along with this? Oh. Because he's doing all this talking. Yeah. I mean, we're talking, there are page long monologues in right. this chapter. And you're thinking, okay, is he, is he, is he a is salesman? Is it working? Is it working? <laughs> and she basically just, just cuts him off and says, no, I mean, I'm crazy about you, but this isn't going to happen. This yeah. can't happen. And I don't want, and the more you talk about those, how you, because it is sort of manipulative in a way. Like we mentioned how, oh, it's so charming that he talked yeah. about how he felt about her the first way. And it's like, now you're telling me? That's true. At like the worst Would've possible time. Would have been nice time. to come up a little earlier. Yeah. They were and so it's, it's, engaged. it's just this way. We've, we've seen that he can be a little manipulative, the way he treated uh, Blanche and stuff. Mm. And so now he's just like, well, I'm going to, I'm probably going to lose you. 
and now I'm gonna I'm gonna try to be just as just most heartfelt and emotionally well know. truthful, you know, expressing yeah. his true emotions. And so it's just like, how dare you bring this up now and tear at me because <laughs> you know I can't stay. And so that's, that's that true. that one really hit me. Yeah, that's a good strong moment for Jane, where she, you know, I guess you, you were saying you weren't sure where where it was going, like if she was going to stay with Rochester after all this, all these pages of text, and mm-hmm. now that you saw that line, you were like, okay, Jane's still she's still on the right path. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. <laughs> Well, again, this was this was just a fully loaded chapter. I appreciate the listeners sticking with us and letting us do two episodes. I hope you enjoyed them both. We'll get back to the normal chapter length, I think, yeah. for the next episode. Even though we're going to be down one main character, so we'll right, uh, right. see what couple we'll see what happens be next. A totally different story now, but I'm glad that we spent a lot of time on this one because this is a very important chapter. Yeah, thanks for sticking with us. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. This really helps us grow and reach new listeners. If you want to talk Jane Eyre with me online, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at airguide. That's E-Y-R-E. And if you want to hear more from me, I host my own podcast called Out of Touchstone, where my good friend Chad and I discuss all the films that Disney produced for their Touchstone Pictures label. You can also find me on Twitter at Mike DeKalb. Thank you and farewell for the present. <laughs>